In Matthew chapter 24, verse 16, Jesus told the early disciples that there would come a time when they had to flee to the mountains. Will such a time come again during the mark of the beast crisis? The answer is yes, and we need to be ready. A thousand years before there was a Protestant, there were Sunday laws that originated in pagan sun worship. For centuries, the church ruled the world until the Protestant Reformation. Men like Martin Luther championed personal and religious freedom. Thousands fled to America to seek freedom from religious tyranny. Will Protestants and freedom-loving Americans fight to keep freedom alive, or will we descend into a modern dark age? The Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. Episode five, when to head for the hills. Welcome to the grand finale, part five of a special series called The Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. The title is called for our final series, or our final program is when to head for the hills. I'm here with Nick Meisner. He's a personal friend of mine. He's, he has a lovely wife named Lisa. They both have a little boy named Nathan. And he knows a lot about mountains, wilderness living, and the woods. And he also loves Jesus, and he's a student of prophecy. So Nick, uh, thank you for being my guest for the big capstone of this uh, incredible series. We've covered so much. And, and let me just mention, and I've, I've said this before, that uh, in five programs, it's really impossible to cover all the details. So we're going to just do our best to cover a lot in the next uh, 26 or so minutes. We do have a book called The Great Controversy that will be available at the end of this program. It's a little commercial, and if people want to learn a lot more, they can read that book and, and be enlightened about what the Bible says about the future. Right. So Nick, just tell us a little bit uh, in, in the introduction about your ministry and what you do. Well, we are sustainable preparedness. That's kind of a funny name. What does that mean? Well, preparedness, I hark back to one of my favorite verses of Scripture, Proverbs 21, 31. It says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And so it's uh, God has given us as humans a part to do. He always cooperates with us. But we don't have the ability to do these things on our own. We need God's help. And so it's this cooperation of human effort plus divine power uh, that is really brought out in the word preparedness. And sustainable, this is all about, you know, you hear so much about preparedness today, stockpiling food or water, this or that. And uh, I really don't like that whole concept for a number of reasons. But one thing is that, that folks, when they practice that, they are all in the, the hoarding mindset kind of thing. And what I like about sustainable preparedness is it's where we are able to produce basic necessities of life for an ongoing period of time, as in growing your own food, you know, having a reliable water supply that's going to work even if you don't have power from the power company, and you know, ability to heat your home. And, Solar power, yeah, things like that. Possibly, but especially focusing on the basic necessities of life. That's what we do, is to really try and help folks focus on these basic necessities of life because you know I think about uh, Revelation 13 17 that there's going to come a time when no man will be able to buy or sell save he that has the mark and so that brings this whole concept of basic necessities to my mind and so when I'm talking to folks I say what would you do right now if you could not buy or sell a thing from this point on how would you fare and in today's society that would be catastrophic, absolutely catastrophic for almost everyone. And this seems like a really new concept, but it's not. This is the way that most people lived just a century ago. The specialization of labor has brought this about in today's lifestyle where everything is specialized and folks are brilliant in one particular thing, but they're fairly ignorant about the other, you know, just taking care of some of their most basic necessities. And, and so, you, so you get you teach people how to do some of these basic sustainable exactly. preparedness uh, as a benefit as we move into the crisis. But of course, we'll talk about before we're done that there comes a point in time where we're going to wholly rely on God, uh, and, and we just—it's not a matter of having a garden or food or any of these things. Uh, when we're at the final moments of history we're just going to be completely dependent upon Jesus himself. And of course we are now, but you're saying that he helps us to get ready as much as we can so that we can serve him better. 
and for as long as possible uh, before the door finally closes. Right, and he will not do for us what he's given us the power to do for ourselves. And so, you know, this is just, this is throughout the scriptures, this principle. And so that's what we're trying to help folks do to get out of today's mindset of just assuming that these huge corporations are always going to provide for our needs and and do the things that God has instructed us to, to, you know, to, to live a lifestyle that's more, you know, simple and back to the land. It's good for us, good for us spiritually exactly. and it's helpful. Well, let's get back, let's get to the Bible. Uh, the, the text that I read a little, bit, a little bit ago talks about fleeing to the mountains. So that's why I, I brought you here as our guest. Let's look at the whole context here of what Jesus is saying. This is in Matthew 24, I'm assuming you that that is a Bible there. You've got your right. scriptures in there inside yes. your tablet. That's right. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. And, and when you study Matthew 24, it's clear that Jesus describes the destruction of Jerusalem and events surrounding that destruction. Right. And he parallels that with events at the end of the world. Matthew 24 goes back and forth between Jerusalem and the end, Jerusalem and the end. And in Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus told his disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who have nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. It's interesting Jesus mentions the Sabbath hmm. in this context. And then he said, for then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. Now let's just talk about the context of this uh, in the days of Jesus, and then we'll tie it in with the parallel at the end of the world. What's, what's going on here? Well, we have Jesus predicting, of course, the downfall of Jerusalem and... Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Exactly, it's destruction, which it happened in you know stages it didn't it wasn't something that just boom all happened just like so but you had the roman army's approach uh, under cestius i believe it was surrounded the city for no apparent reason they pulled back then three and a half years later they come surround the city under general titus under titus and the siege that followed was unimaginable. We, words cannot describe. And, and Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. I think it was something like a million Jews had been taken captive. A lot of people died. And, and I think it's important to realize that the reason why God allowed his own city to be destroyed was because uh, that was in 70 AD. And what happened prior to 70 AD was the Jewish leaders had made a, a, the fateful decision to, to put to death Jesus, who ultimately was their creator, right. and they pressured Pontius Pilate to issue it, uh, to give them over to give Jesus over to the mob, and so because the Jewish leaders really connected with Pilate, who was representing the state, you have the Jewish church and the state combining right. to put to death their creator. Uh, it was because of that event, which happened in the 30s, that then in the 70s, 70 A.D., that's when the Roman armies came and destroyed Jerusalem. Right. And Jesus gave his disciples a sign that they were to get out at a certain point. And it was that first siege. The first siege. So when, when the first uh, army surrounded J Jerusalem, you mentioned that history tells us that for some mysterious reason, they just backed out. They planted their banners, made their intentions known that they were going to conquer that city, and then just left. And that was, the, uh, that, was the, that was pagan Rome, right. planted its banner right outside Jerusalem. Right. Then they left, and, and before they came back, the Christians saw the sign. Exactly. They realized this is a sign, and they got out. They and you fled know, Steve, into the mountains. It's significant that not a single Christian died in that siege. Wow. And you know why? It's because every single one of them heeded the sign and they did as Jesus instructed exactly. them. Exactly, they followed the, the warning. And the sooner they did it, the easier it was. If they left right away, the, the Jewish armies who were persecuting them, the Jewish armies were out chasing the Romans. If they did as Jesus instructed, and right then, they would have a clear path up to Pella and the mountains. That was a little city that they went to. So they fled to the mountains. Now, again, Matthew 24 deals with parallels. And, and Jesus said in verse 15, he said, whoso reads, let him understand that there is a parallel. And the parallel is that in the final days, when 
religious leaders around the world and, and the common people because of, their, uh, because of the deception about Sunday and how important they think Sunday is to the health of the planet, to coming back to God and to uh, families and everything else the whole part of the big mark of the beast deception, and then what happens is the church and the, and the people pressure the government to pass a law which really is uh, going against the Creator. Just like the Jewish people pressured Pilate to put the Creator, who was in human form, to death, so, and, and then the Roman armies came, the pagan Roman armies, so in the end times we have papal Rome and the people pressuring government to pass a Sunday law which really is a law against the creator of, of heaven and earth. And that is, the, is one of the final signs at the very end that time is almost over and that uh, the final judgments of God are about, are about to drop. Right, coming on the cities. That's right, and it doesn't make sense to me that if we, when we get into the final crisis of the history of the world, that God will not be especially speaking to his people about these kind of events. That's right. He wants us to be ready, and he's always given special revelation and instruction to his people during special crisis. Uh, I just came back just a few, few weeks ago from a, a very large gathering in San Antonio, Texas, right next to the Alamo, hmm. and it was a general conference session of about 65,000 Seventh-day Adventists, hmm. and it was amazing. And, and one, one day I had lunch, with a Vietnamese pastor. And this pastor, he said uh, to a group of us that he had had four uh, visions hmm. and that, that an angel spoke to him specifically and told him that, that time is running out. Hmm. Time is running out. Hmm. And there's a, there's a scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 17, that says, it will come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And it talks about his men servants and maid servants that God will pour out his spirit. And especially in the last days, this just makes perfect sense. And when I think about that pastor having that vision, and I've heard other people who have had special visions in light of the scripture, giving us instruction of what to do. And I think you have a, a yes. vision that was given to another, another woman. Way uh, back in 1905. 1905, looking forward to the day when, when America joins with the papacy, violates the principle of separation church and state, plants its standard in America, just like the Roman armies planted their standards, so now we've got papal Rome planting its standard, and Sunday is enforced by law, which is a denial of the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which is a denial of the, uh, the law of the creator of heaven and earth. And with Jerusalem, in Jerusalem's case, that resulted in disaster, right. disaster. Right. And in the end, times when that finally happens again, we can expect the same kind of judgments to fall. Absolutely. And you have something to read where yes. that it was exactly what was revealed. Right. She said, when I was at Nashville, I'd been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, they said. You knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never told them or given them any warning at all. Wow. And you know, when I read that, I just think, I, we have to read that to the folks that are watching this. That's right. I don't want them to say that to me. Yeah, me neither. And people that, those of us that know what Bible prophecy says, what Revelation 13 says, what's coming concerning the mark of the beast, and the judgments that are to follow, there's the seven last plagues described in Revelation 16 that fall on those who get the mark of the beast. We have to warn people, we have to tell people what's coming and point them to the Bible and urge them to come to Jesus now right. uh, before, before it's too late. And she mentioned Nashville, but that's not just specifically that that's the only place where these kinds of things are gonna be happening. You know, this is, the, I believe that when national apostasy happens, we're gonna see national ruin, not just Nashville. Yes. 
you know, but on a, on a wide scale. That's right. The Supreme Court has already made a decision uh, against marriage as described in the Bible. Okay. Marriage was created by God, established by God on the sixth day of creation week. And then there's the seventh day next where God rested. And we are expecting that our government and governments around the world are eventually going to uh, pass more laws that will be attacking the seventh day Sabbath and that that will be the final, the final actions that will tell us that the final judgments of God are in the land. Right. Now let's go, let's go to Revelation and let's look at some of these details. Uh, Revelation 13 verse 16 tells us that he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads and that no one may be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. So when the mark is enforced by the American government and by governments around the world that follow America, uh, people won't be able to buy and sell. Now does this, we see a crisis coming. We see the Sunday law so apparent solution to the crisis being really the enforcement of the mark. And do you see that we won't be able to buy or sell uh, right away? Or do you see this, this developing, this crisis developing uh, as it unfolds? Well, as with anything else, it happens gradually. Almost nothing just happens instantly. And so what I can see is a grassroots movement building, getting to the point where maybe some people decide that, that they don't like this class of people, they don't, you know, they feel that, that they're doing the wrong thing and maybe these people on their own decide we're not going to do business with these people. And I can see it starting with that sort of a situation, just a grassroots movement of people starting to do that and growing and growing and as if there's enough support, eventually it becomes a law. And so I see this coming, it's a situation where it gets more and more difficult to buy and sell, finally it's made law and it's impossible. Okay, and, and we, we often refer to this as the little time of trouble, mm -hmm. right? Before the big time of trouble when we actually have to head to the hills and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, I also, I wanna stress that when that time comes, when the mark of the beast is enforced, Sunday's legislated, and it's growing to the point where people won't be able to buy or sell and it's, it's the, final, the final issue, uh, Revelation chapter 14 describes the third angel's message going out to the world at this time by the people of God who who have his spirit, who have studied prophecy, and who know what to say. Revelation 14, 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. Hmm. And then it concludes with, with, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And as I look at that, that part in verse 9 about the message going out with a loud voice during the mark of the beast crisis, uh, I can't help but think of Jesus when he died on the cross. It says Jesus cried with a loud voice and he said, it is finished, it is done. And, and I, I strongly believe, Nick, that, that when this message finally goes out to the whole world during the final crisis, during the mark of the beast with a loud voice, that at the heart of that loud voice needs to be the loud cry of, of the suffering of Jesus that he died on the cross because we've broken God's law. He died on the cross to pay for all of our sins, right. including our sins of breaking the Sabbath, right. the day of the Creator. Uh, he's the center of everything. Right. And so as we're seeing this crisis unfold, we need to be lifting up Jesus, calling people to him, and it's gonna be an earnest cry that this move on the part of our government, uniting church and state, enforcing Sunday, establishing papal Rome's principles on American soil, which is, which is going to result in disaster, just like the destruction of Jerusalem and judgments on cities across America. Uh, God is gonna have a people who give a message with a loud cry, and Jesus needs to be in the middle of that message. Absolutely. I'm, I'm totally convinced of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And you know, you were talking about how God's people are going to be giving a loud cry at that time. And I think this is an important fact to bring up. A lot of people, they think of time of trouble or whatever, and they just figure, you know, curling up next to a fire and watching right. it happen. And we, we don't realize that this is a time of intense activity for anyone who is true to God. We have a work to do. And this is why I'm so passionate about this whole concept of sustainable preparedness because when you're dealing with a situation where it's getting more and more difficult and finally impossible to buy or sell, it is going to be incredibly beneficial to you and to the work that God has given you to do if you are in a position to be able to provide for those 
basic necessities of life. You're not That's only right. going to be able to take care of yourself and your family and continue the work God has given you to do, but you're also going to be in a position to help others because this is, you know, disasters coming upon the land. People are going to need help. So sustainable preparedness helps people to be more self-sufficient so when the crisis hits and people uh, eventually can't buy or sell, it just gives us more freedom to be able to spread the third angel's message for as long as possible. Exactly. As long as possible. Now at some point, uh, everybody's going to make their choice right. and the door is going to close. To the ark. That's right. Just like Noah's ark, the door closed, then there were there was seven days until the flood came. Revelation 16 is very clear that when everybody makes their choice for, for the Bible or for the beast, for, for Jesus or for the devil, for uh, the seventh day Sabbath, which is a sign of the Creator, or the first day of the week, which goes back to pagan sun worship and, and hostility to Jews and, and compromises and traditions of men, then the doors of heaven are going to close. Everyone's going to be on one side or the other. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 11, Jesus will say, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. He that's righteous, righteous still. He that's holy, holy still. And everybody will be divided into two great classes. And at that point, uh, we call that the close of probation, then it's over. It's over. And then what, what, what happens is the big time of trouble hits. Uh, Daniel 12 describes uh, that there will be a time of trouble such as never was yeah. since there was a nation, even yeah. to that same time. Now, there's another, another uh, vision or dream that you have there right. uh, from that same person who right. saw the, the uh, balls of fire coming on Nashville and saw people saying, why didn't you tell us right. that these judgments were coming? Uh, re read that part about about heading to the hills. Yes, I love this. It's so encouraging. She says, this is from manuscript 153, 1905. Uh, I did not sleep much the night after the Sabbath, for during the night a very impressive scene passed before me. There seemed to be great confusion and the conflict of armies. A messenger from the Lord stood before me and said, call your household. I will lead you. Follow me. He led me down a dark passage through a forest then through the clefts of mountains, and said, Here you are safe. There were others who had been led to this retreat. Isn't that encouraging? Wow. The heavenly messenger said, The time of trouble has come as a thief in the night, as the Lord warned you it would come. Well, wow. as the Lord warned you it would come. And that's what Daniel 12, verse 1 says, that there shall be there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So, right. so we're, we're here, we want to be as, as prepared as we can, we want to help the world, we want to give the message, give the warning message, teach what the Bible says, so that when the crisis hits, people know what to do, and hopefully as many as possible will choose to be on Jesus' side right. and follow the Creator and love Him and take a stand for His Sabbath. Right. And once everybody does and the doors close and the big time of trouble hits, at that point, uh, there, there's no more people going back and forth, no more changing sides. It's all over. Yeah. And that, that is the time, as Matthew, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 16, that's the time for us to flee to the hills. And uh, as you read that revelation, the angel appeared and said, this is what's going to happen. God is going to be leading his people out into the mountains, into secluded places, and he will provide food and water for his people. I think about the Israelites. They went out of Egypt, about a million of them, and they were or two million. They went uh, into the wilderness, and they were there for 40 years. And they really didn't have water, and they didn't have food. But God protected and gave them food and water during that time. We live in the country, and there's going to time come when we're taking our kids, your, your little boy Nathan, uh, my son uh, Seth, and Abby, and my wife Kristen, and we're just we're, we're heading to the hills because it's a time of trouble. It's all over. Everybody's made their choice. The plagues are falling, but God's protecting his people. Right. And then we're out there, and the angels of God are going to take care of us and give us food and water. And it's just an illustration of this principle of human effort and divine power. You know, God has given us a part to do. He says, do what you can. And when the time comes where it's impossible for you to do that anymore, don't worry. I will take care of you. Right. And so this, this message of preparedness, there's no reason, no room for fear in it because we have the assurance of God that as long as we're doing the part he's given us to do, he will take care of the rest. Right. And God will guide us. And if you have a backpack, you'll probably want to take it with you. Yeah. If you've got a charcoal Absolutely. filter and if you've got a sleeping bag, I think it would be good. But if you don't, then Psalm 91 talks about how God will take care of his people during the crisis. Yeah. Do what you can now. Do everything you can 
and leave the rest in God's right. hands. Do our part, spread, spread the truth, spread the message of revelation, warn uh, the people in the cities of what's coming that this, this Sunday law movement, while it, it apparently looks good in the name of families, in the name of, of God, in the name of uh, protecting the environment, cutting carbon emissions, uh, and having the world come together, it really is a massive deception of the devil and it will result in a disaster to America and to the rest of the world as the judgments of God fall in the final days. And people need to know that that's coming. And that's why we're here, isn't it? That's right. That's, that's what right. your ministry is all about. That's what White Horse Media is all about. Uh, Nick, it, it re reminds me of, you mentioned not being afraid. Uh, I've got my little girl and you've got your little boy and you can't help but <laughs> you know, look into their little faces and uh, say, Lord, please, you've got to take care of us. Yes. It reminds me of a story I heard about a little, a little girl. She was about five years old and she was sleeping in her, in her room one night and she was scared because it was dark. So she got up and she went down the hallway and she went into her, her, her dad's room. And she said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. Can I, can I come in bed with you? And uh, the father said, of course, honey, come in, come in bed with me. So she plopped in and, and the father, you know, laid down next to her and, but the lights were still off and it was dark and she said, Daddy, I'm still scared. I'm still scared. And so then, and then she said, is your face toward me? <laughs> You're laying next to me, but is your face turned toward me? And then the father said, yes, honey, my face is toward you. You don't need to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And that just impresses me that when yes. the final time comes, God's face is going to be toward his people. He's going to take care of us. He promises that he will. He'll watch over us. Uh, the bad news is there's trouble coming, big trouble. But the good news is that Jesus is going to bring his people through that time of trouble. And he's going to protect us and get us ready and uh, have us ready at the end when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Uh, the book of Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And then it says, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. I want my name in that book. God wants your name in that book. God wants all of us in that book. And if we follow Jesus in the Bible, worship our Creator and stand for His commandments, we'll stay in the book and He'll get us ready for His glorious return.